So, time to get back into the technical domain for the conference. All of us are well versed with multi-factor authentication and you has come all the way from Vietnam. Please welcome him with a loud round of applause. And the stage is all yours, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay. Everyone can hear me? Thank you. Okay. Right. So uh, my name is Hugh. Uh, I'm from Vietnam currently. I'm working in Singapore for a company called Ascenda Loyalty. Uh, you can find me online from most of the place uh, with the name Hugh K09. Uh, so I have been working about uh, 11 years at engineer and uh, the last four years I have been building like authentication system. So that's why today I will talk about like how to build a resilient uh, multi-factor authentication framework. Uh, so for the agenda today we will talk about like what is uh, multi-factor authentication and uh, why do we even need it and then like how to build a framework for that and finally uh, we can talk about like what is the pros and cons for different approach and what can be, what can be improved. Uh, so before that, let's talk about, a bit about like my company. So it is called Ascenda Loyalty. So it is basically a B2B2C uh, business. So it build a uh, loyalty program for like financial service with the bank. Uh, so we, it build using Rails and Hanami. So because uh, like our client is the bank, so they are pretty particular about like protecting the user account. So normally like when a user come into a, like the, your system, any system, uh, and then they want to access an account, for example, then how do we uh, verify the, that ownership? So a ba more basic way would be like having a login page with a username and password, right? And then when user type in the username and password, then the authentication server can verify whether that much, and if that much, then the user can come in the system. Otherwise, we display an error. So what happened if like an attacker go there like using some uh, method like for example social engineering or like like getting a database of passcode that already leaked somewhere and get that authentication get that credentials and then they can type in the username and password there for the server right and then the, like if we don't have anything then probably the attacker now can access the like valid user account. So one easy and simple way to do it would be like after like verifying the username and password, we can just display a, like a pay for user to type in an OTP where they can get it from like an authenticator app or like the SMS. So that is basically like what we call a second factor authentication. Uh, okay. So like how to build like such a thing then? Like a traditional approach would be like you have the first factor authentication, which is the username and the password. And then the second factor is the, the email. So you have on that in your user table, for example. And then like you can have a, a like if condition like this in your uh, session controller, for example, user authenticate with username, password, and then we check it whether like you need to trigger MMA or not. And then if Yes, then you need to uh, like trigger MA using the user email. So what is the problem with this approach? Uh, basically, like for example, if the user come in and said that I don't want to use email for the MFA, like I want to use SMS or Authenticator, or like they want to be able to choose between like multiple ways. For example, if they lost their phone and then they don't have the SMS and Authenticator app anymore and they want to log in, with MA using like the email, for example. Then with all that, then if you use this approach, then you probably will have a lot of if, else, a lot of condition, and like it's not very easy for user to actually choose the authentication factor. Like for example, like if you want this like it like this, like for Google choosing a form a lot of uh, option like this, or like in GitHub choosing like authentication uh, option or like your username and password, then it's not very easy. So currently, like when I search in internet, then usually like if people are only using device and they usually add like device to factor authentication, for example, but then it only allow you to use a authentical app. So if you want to trigger MA using email, then you need to build like some customization. And if you don't rely on device, then you probably will need to build your own thing using uh, 
the Ruby one-time password library. Or like a newer kit in the blocks like WebAuthn, that you can use it, but uh, currently it only supports a few modern uh, browser, and it doesn't support the thing that require uh, PII, like email or SMS. So the thing about like multi-factor authentication, like it basically like in the end it's just authentication, right? Uh, it like no matter the type authentication, it always have like two main flow. So for example, if you have a user, then before it can be in your system, then they need to register, they register their, their, their username and password, and then after that, they, like when they want to access your system, then they need to authenticate, right? They need to input your username and password. So it's the same for any other factor. Like if you, you want to like authenticate using email, then you also need to type in your email first at the registration part. And then after that, like for example, if you send them an OTP, then it's the authentication part. Now you need to type key in your OTP to authenticate. So uh, an imp like, uh, in order to do something like that, then we need to revise the original schema a bit. So now, in order to support multiple factor, like we probably will need a, a factor table, for example. And then from there, then we have uh, identities. Uh, so the identity, we have the factor name and like factor value. Factor name is basically like the factor that we want to support, like authentical app or like email or SMS. Uh, the factor value we basically now is the, on the, uh, the detail here, like the username or the, the email. So why do we need that? Like, do, why do we need the... The, uh, the identity. So basically, like, in order to, to be more flexible, actually, like, for example, if you want to have, like, two emails to log in, for example, for a single user, then if you have a single email field, then it's very hard for you. And if you have two email fields, like, email one and email two, then it's not very easy to do. Uh, so, like, if you store it at, like, a separate table and identity, then it gives you a lot more flexibility. And the second thing is uh, the mandability. Like, for example, uh, if you have separate factor, then when user come in, they, what they need to do is only choosing the factor. So they can choose like login using password or email or like phone number. And from there, you can like trigger a strategy, a separate strategy for each uh, factor. Uh, like for registration, for example, then they can uh, choose like they want to log in using email. And then you can go for the email strategy and then like create an identity like uh, with the factor name is the email and then the factor value is the actual email that the, the user input in. Like for all other strategy, then it's probably the same. And each of them can have like different registration strategies, right? Like for the phone, then you can send an SMS to the phone to verify like that phone is actually belong to the user. For the username password, then you can have two fields, like the password and then the password confirmation. So you verify that, okay, like user don't make any mistake when typing the password. So you can have like different like UX for, for all of those strategy. So finally, like why, when we have an identity, so basically own identity will have a similar schema. So now you don't have different fields like username or email or like phone number, anything else. Then by all of them will be like factor name, factor value for example, then you can easily create a unified flow, the main flow for the owner that, and like owner differences can be moved into the strategy. So after the registration, then it could be the authentication part. So basically login is just like you go to login and then you file first factor identity. And the multi-factor authentication is similar, that you go to the authentication server and file the second uh, factor identity. So the code now will be a bit more complex. So now, like, when we authenticate, we need a factor, and then we ask for the credential from user. Like, that credential can be uh, the username password, or like, the OTP that the user sent. Uh, and then, like, after, like, verify the first factor, then we can check whether the user still need to do multi-factor authentication. If they need, then we can f simply, like, find all the remaining identity and if they have a lot of identity, then we can display a, fee, uh, a page for them to choose from there. And then like from there, then we can trigger a similar exactly uh, authentication flow. So here, for example, then you can split the, the authentication part into two phases. First is the, the request phase. 
So like the login will user coming in and then choose like password, and we can display the face with the username password. It is the, the request file, and only after they send the submit, then it will be a call back file. But we, we, we check like whether the username password match. So it's very similar if you use a different strategy like email or like phone. Then we will show a face asking for like the email or the phone number. And then when they trigger, then we will send OTP to the user. And only in the call back file, when the user submit the OTP, then we will check again like whether the OTP match the secret that we store in the, in the identity in the first place. Okay, so like after we, we authenticate, then how do we define like when to trigger like the, the, the normal login or when we trigger the, uh, the MFA? So usually like it will be used, can we, we can use that using the session. So when we check in the session that there is no factor, no, no user session, then probably we can ask them to log in. Right? After we already create a like authentication, then we will store a factor in the, in the session. And after that, then whenever we see that, okay, there is already a user session, then we can just add in more factor. So from this, then we can also know that like which factor the user already used to log in. And then we can use like on the rebranding factor for like, multi, like for verification, for multiple uh, factor authentication. So the advantage of this approach is that like now you actually can use own your factor for either login or MFA. Basically, like when the user go in, then they say that they, I want to use phone number. Then they can use phone to actually log in. You can send an OTP to them, and then they can type in OTP, and they can log in. And it is similar, like you can use username and password if you want, or you can even use like uh, Google, like authenticator to log in. And then after, only after that, then if you deem the user at like they still need to require verification, then you can trigger the remaining factor for them to choose. And then adding a new factor is very easy as long as they have the same flow uh, with uh, like the registration part, the uh, con uh, like the request phase, and then the callback phase. So, so you can add all the strategy, but the main flow will remain intact. And then like because you have the it, the factor at a separate table and an identity separate table, then if you want to enable or disable a factor, then it's very easy. So like for example, like in our case, then some bank doesn't really want the user to actually log in using the SMS, then we can simply just display, disable that factor. And then like the rest can still use the, the other one to for login. So what could be the drawback for this approach then? Like, so it, as you can see then, it's much more complex. Uh, like now you have like three tables instead of like a single table like before. So it's come more complex. So like if you don't really need more than two factor authentication, then probably you don't need to do all of this. Like, but if you need to like add the, the third or the, the fourth factor, then probably it would be a good, good chance for you to, to add the, like this, to use this approach. And the second thing is like, not every factor can be implemented this way. So for example, like if you use FIDO and you use a, uh, what is it? The, the platform verification where you use your uh, fingerprint to log in, then you should like, you can really, cannot really use store that at the, the identity because uh, it will only apply for that machine. Like if they use another machine, then you don't have the identity and then display it will be a bit tricky for user. But like some of this can be mitigated a bit. So, like from this then like you can have a lot of improvement. Like you can implement like the, the before flow uh, at the basic, but then if you want more complex flow, then it's also possible. So for example, in our case then, for email then we, user can, not, can log in with not just OTP. Like we can allow them to send a link and then they, when they click on that link, then they can simply log in. Or like the phone, phone then they can like send the OTP via SMS or they can call the user. So. Like we allow all of that, it, it's quite easy. We can just add the, like what we call a new verification type and, and add a strategy for each of the verification type. So now with this approach, then it's fairly easy to, to model all of that. And then like for FIDO, for example, then, then it 
you can also improve that by uh, like create a new type identity, adding some uh, attribute to it to note that, okay, this identity only be able to use on a certain machine. Uh, or like for, for some, some type of uh, other factor like for GitHub, right? In the case that you can just log in and then when you verify, then you can say that like some, some or you can verify using some other session. So you can open another app to verify that, okay, I verify that this session, login session is valid. Then it's also a bit tricky, but we can create, like also adding some, some uh, special attribute to that identity to say that, okay, you can, when you click on this, then, then it trigger a new verification flow. Okay, so that pretty much it for my talk. So, uh, like, because we have a lot of talks, so I don't expect that everyone will remember all of this, but hopefully, like, there will be two things, uh, three things that we, I want you to remember. So, first of all, like, multi factor authentication is basically just authentication. So, uh, you can try to, like, model that in the same way so that it's easier to extend and expand upon. And the second thing is like storing like your credential and user information in identity would help you uh, make authentication easier and like more flexible. And last thing is like you can define a main flow for your app and then like adding separate strategy for distinct verification and it will help you like make like maintainability easier for you. Yep, so that pretty much it for my talk. Uh, thank you everyone for Listening. Thank you. You uh, questions? All right. I, I actually I had one question. Okay. Uh, for Web three yes. and distributed identifiers or DWNs, do you all support MFA there too with those identities? So I I I. Honestly, I don't really have a. Honestly, I don't have a lot of idea about web web three. But I think like this idea can be applied anywhere. Like you probably can create identity in anywhere, like, and then use them for authentication. So it can be implemented a bit different, but the idea can be applied. Like. Okay. Interesting. Any thought? Oh, there it starts. It's all about triggering a question. Uh, there are a few authentication application where I saw that. Even if you're on offline, it will generate some token. Yes. And then you can uh, use that token. I mean, that is time-based. And you can use that token to authenticate, like MFA. Yes. So I was wondering, like, how does that work? Because it is not able to communicate with the server while it is offline. Uh, so so it's quite simple. Like, it basically doesn't communicate anywhere. So it stores a secret in the app. That secret can be used with the time to create different uh, like one-time password, and when we verify, right, uh, we basically the verify the OTP with the pass uh, with the secret that we store in our server. Which means that the algorithm is there, and if the algorithm is there and is based on time base, uh, there's a more chances of fraud, isn't it? Yeah. So, like, if you like, basically, it's a secret, right? So, if we leak the secret anywhere, then then the attacker can also use that secret to generate the same OTP. And then send it to server and like uh, act at yourself, act at you at the account. So it's very similar to like when you have the username and password, right? So if you lost your password, uh, and then the attacker can also use that password to, to do anything. Yeah, so, so the authenticator app is also the same. Like it's not a secret, and if you lost that secret, then the attacker can, can do anything with your account. Yeah, I was more concerned about the vulnerability. I, I, I mean, obviously, they have to have the same algorithm which can generate maybe based on timestamp or user attribute or something. Yeah, the, 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 the algorithm is fairly simple. Uh, a lot of library already support that algorithm and you only need to uh, type in the secret and it will generate like OTP for you. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay, thank you so much you, thank you for thank your you. talk. Thank you.